and we'll begin the way that we normally do. By sitting for about a half an hour. Thank you, Lori. So you can find yourself into a comfortable enough posture to remain in for the next half an hour or so. And instead of needing to do anything, we're sort of just getting out of the way of this natural process of settling that happens. And what we might have missed already is that there was this intention in the heart. An intention for something good. Perhaps an intention to let go. Intention to cultivate some particular flavor of goodness of heart. And from that intention, this natural settling happens. You can simply tune in to how that feels. Listening. Dropping any notions that there's a right way to do this. It's more of an intuitive listening. Listening to the heart. Listening to this entire embodied system. process of settling, the process of listening, involves getting closer, being more deeply intimate with the way things are, the way of the body, the way of the heart. This interconnected relationship of heart and body. You might notice a natural connection with the sensations of the body. A natural noticing of the breath. It requires so little effort actually to attune to listen.
It's almost like the sincerity of the intention to connect, to feel into this embodied experience is enough. The sense that the intention is sincere can really be enough. And as we listen and receive experience, we start to feel into the relationship here, knowing more deeply what it's like to be alive. And also creatively learning how to participate skillfully with experience. And once again, this isn't a kind of doing. More of a receiving, feeling. Being sensitive. Perhaps we notice that the mind is distracted or easily lost in thought. And yet there are these bright, beautiful moments when there's a returning to presence. You feel very mysterious, like how did that happen? Just naturally dropped it's proliferation. Returning. Listening. Aware of the body and the heart once again. Illuminating this healthy desire to be awake, to be alive. It doesn't even feel like someone is making that happen.
perhaps we learn the skillful art of relating or participating with pleasant experience or unpleasant experience. Being into the natural tendencies to lean in to what's pleasant or avoid what's unpleasant. Perhaps sleepiness, the seductive pleasantness of sleepiness sucks us in. And yet there's this, once again, this natural returning, this curiosity about being awake that feels so impersonal. Returning us once again to this embodied experience that we're having. And perhaps there's a kind of difficult, painful heart experience that we're having. We learn the art of space, giving it space to breathe. Breathing deeply with it. Inviting the body to move it. And trusting our intuitive wisdom here. The work of practice. It's not forceful. Gentle, intuitive, receptive, persistent. Creative. Remembering that there are no problems here. Everything that arises is natural. It's nature, it belongs. You belong. We bring our own creative flavor to participation, to this active process of relating.
We'll continue in silence now.
And you can open your eyes whenever you're ready. It's your practice, everyone. Welcome to stretch, move the body. It's good to feel your presence here this morning. Let's see, all 142 of you. Wonderful, and probably a few more tuning in over YouTube. Maybe we'll listen to it later. So on <clears throat> Wednesday nights, I've been working my way through a book. We've been working through a book together called Listening to the Heart. A Contemplative Journey to Engage Buddhism by Tanisara and Kitty Saro. We're about two thirds of the way through the book now. It's been almost a year, I think, maybe, maybe, yeah, close to a year. And so I've decided to just, um, yeah, I've been reading some of the earlier chapters again and um, interesting how this book really painted a picture from beginning until where we are in chapter 11 around what it means to listen. And I've been really, you know, curious about this question and especially how it relates to this natural kind of participation in life. When we have a sincere interest in listening and hearing the response, listening to our own heart and getting closer and closer to this kind of sensitivity that develops with practice that allows us to really hear the depth of our hearts. And one of the early um, quotes in the book is from their teachers, Ajahn Chah, Tanisara and Kitty Saro's teacher, who was one of the great Thai forest masters. Um, and Ajahn Chah says, Dhamma or Dharma is in your heart, not in the forest. Don't believe others. Just listen to your heart. You don't have to go and look anywhere else. Wisdom is in you. Just like the sweet ripe mango is already a young green one. With even a little intuitive wisdom, you will be able to see clearly the ways of the world. You will come to understand that everything in the world is your teacher. It's like just beautiful instruction to listen deeply, to get close to the truth of our experience, to really feel into what's moving in the heart and manifesting in an embodied way. And this last line is, you will come to understand that everything in the world is your teacher. It's like this reality that we don't have to throw anything away. We don't, you know, as practitioners, we can feel like sometimes that what's required is sort of a implicit reliance on seclusion, like removal, you know, it's like a misunderstanding of seclusion, but really taking the truth of seclusion, this value of seclusion and applying it everywhere we move, everywhere we go, you know, all of those moments where we're participating both in our internal experience and also with our families and our communities. And so that brings, that brought me back to this quote um, from James Baldwin. The world changes according to the way people see it. And if you alter even but a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. The world changes according to the way people see it. If you alter even but a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. So 
So listening as a change agent. And this is so much of what we do in practice. It's like learning how to listen and transform, right? We're really interested in transformation on this path. So interested in change, interested in understanding change and, and the way change happens. Buddhism lays out this beautiful path, but the way we walk it is up to us. It's really our responsibility. The teachings are a guide, and but the how of walking the path is a much more creative process that we figure out by deeply listening to the special flavors that are moving right here in this particular embodied existence. And it's when we really surrender or let go of all of our preconceived notions about what practice is or what it has to be, how to live, how to relate to life, we begin a more serious inquiry. It's a, about surrendering to not knowing really, not knowing, not having the answers, but being willing to find them and allow them to deepen and evolve, these inquiries to deepen and evolve as we move forward. And some of the, you know, the deepest questions can be very simple, like what is this? How is it that we relate to this experience that we're having? What is this body? What is this heart? What is this thing we call life? It's very mysterious, isn't it? if we let ourselves really go there. And in chapter 11, um, Kitty Sorrow introduces this teaching, Yani Somana Sikara. And it can, the way I've heard this instruction or teaching talked about is like wise, wise relating or wise attention. And yet this word is so, this phrase is so rich. Yani can be, can mean womb or a birthplace down to the origin. So Kitty Saro talks about Yani so mana sikara as placing the mind and its activities in the womb of awareness in the womb of awareness. And just imagine, some of you know directly the experience of having a womb. And we can imagine like what a dynamic place this is, a womb. It's very alive. Right? It's not at all one thing. And so as we learn how to listen, we're really learning to go to the root this chapter Kitty Sorrow calls radical reflection because it has a connection to, radical has a connection to root. So going to the root of things, down to the origin. And realizing too that as we do this, we all have plenty of wisdom. It's not like we have to go get some. It's more of this kind of deep listening that reveals what's naturally there that is often obscured, this deep intuitive wisdom is often obscured by our thinking, right? The proliferation of thought that we get swept away so easily by and try to resolve this dilemma of life, this mysterious and profound deepening inquiry about what is this? We try to resolve that in an intellectual way. But this, the depth of wisdom you know, is really, can really be revealed in this, with this value of seclusion that is able to create some space around the mind, even that thinks. It's not like we have to somehow get rid of the thinking mind. This is just what the mind does, it thinks, right? Just like the ears here and the eyes see, it's just, it's nature. And somehow understand that what's happening here is an activity of mind that we don't have to reject and also can see around, feel into the depth of wisdom that's here that may emerge 
you know, what we know about epigenetics these days is that we really absorb so much generationally, both the wisdom and the trauma of our ancestors. And so we can appreciate the, you know, it just really makes me sort of appreciate the tradition holders, the carriers of this practice, the Asian, our Asian siblings who have carried forward this practice through 2,600 years. So the depth of this wisdom, you know, each in, in their own way, right? Every teacher is somehow different and internalizes the teachings different and every practitioner makes sense of them in a different way. And so receiving, listening is like appreciating that too. Like this intuitive wisdom that emerges has its roots in history, our own individual familial lineages, but also the roots and the, the way it's been, this practice has been transmitted over 2,600 years through our Chinese ancestors, the Japanese ancestors, the Sri Lankan ancestors, Thai, Tibetan, Indian, Burmese, all like humans making sense of the practice in their own way. So this practice really being able to having the capacity to understand and feel into the depth of wisdom that is really inherent here that we're sort of just uncovering in some way requires us to trust ourselves. And if you're anything like me, you might be going, oh, I'll trust myself. Haven't you seen this mind? It's wild in there. <laughs> And trusting is a complex word, but I might say that its roots are both in love and reverence. Like this love, this deep trusting the essential goodness that is there, that is really a part of who we are. You know, even this goodness that is, that guides us to be more sensitive and exposed, right? like exposing the nature of this heart exposing the power the, of the forces of greed and hatred and delusion that are there too. And appreciating the karmic roots of learning, right? just like I've already mentioned. So trusting and having some reverence for all of the forces that pop in our lives in any given time. You know, we're a force of nature. How beautiful is that? It's not such a personal win or loss that we're having right here. We're just a force of ancestry, a force of nature, a force of all the good and all the confusion that has been passed down generation to generation. It's such a, like, really kind of moves my heart to reflect on this. And how this decision that we've made to get more intimate to feel into the sensitivity is also an act of giving something back is participating in that lineage for future generations we're also a manifestation of some love some confusion some wisdom and hopefully our we're receiving that from each other so that we can see more deeply oh yeah this is the way things are and our children are learning that from us. So our practice is somewhat about taking off our rose colored glasses and maybe we never had those on <laughs> all that long anyway, but um, often we come into practice with this somewhat naive, expectation that we're going to get some peace. <laughs> this is one of my favorite children's books is called On's Anger. It's a wonderful book about learning how to take care of anger. 
And in the book, anger is represented by this hairy red monster that kind of gets smaller and smaller as the story goes on, as this child learns how to take care of it. And so this is kind of what our minds are like, this hairy red monster all wild. And when we might come into practice with this naive expectation that we're going to get some peace and all we do is come face to face with this hairy red monster again and again and again and again and again. And we learn to see this hairy red monster in the collective as well, like all the forces of greed and consumption and domination that exist. It can feel overwhelming, like, wow, I just came here for some peace and now all I get is this again and again and again. But it's like, this is it. This is what's the the peace that we find when we listen to the truth of these teachers for us. Every hairy red monster that we see is a teacher. And the peace that we get is learning to revere this teacher. Like, ah, this is the way things are. It's really like this. Truth is really like this. It's really this messy. And somehow I don't have to deny that in order for peace to be here. I can learn, we can learn, and this is not something that is easy to learn, but it is the path that we're walking. This is the inquiry that we're in. This is what happens when we listen. We get closer and closer to knowing that peace in moments when Things feel completely out of control as they are. The world feels a complete mess or when anxiety is completely overpowering us or when rage is all the mind can see. We learn this kind of surrender that happens in these moments. Like, oh, this is a force of nature too. And I really am invested in a path that knows freedom. And so how does that make sense right here? That's the question. How does this make sense right here? This one part of this book, Tanisara is telling a story. She practiced as a monastic, the Ajahn Chah, tradition for more than 11 years, I think. I'm not exactly sure how much along she was there, but quite a long time. And she shared the story in the book about kind of coming undone at one point in practice. She had come back and the person who was supposed to tend the fire was didn't tend the fire and the fire went out and it was cold and which meant she was going to go have to chop wood to restart the fire. And it was just so frustrated with her community and that just kind of, she fell apart in this moment, like allowed herself to scream and I don't want this and just feel the full force of nature in that moment. And it's, here in this, and as she was telling the story, you know, learning that it was in the surrendering to that, that really allowed practice to begin, to begin. So if what you're feeling are these forces of the defilements in the mind, you're on the right path. We're all on the right path. <laughs> the defilements. And these are all, the defilements are all these visitors that are expressions of the wanting mind or the, the mind that pushes away and rejects or just restlessness and worry or apathy, low energy, sluggishness or doubt. You know, and this is where we spend our most time <laughs> as humans, as lay people for sure. We are working with participating, learning how to participate skillfully with these defilements. One of my favorite t- 
Nisara statements is found in this great book, Time to Stand Up, an engaged Buddhist manifesto for our earth. And really, she, I think this passage just illuminates the creativity um, involved in connecting, not being afraid of, and connecting as deeply as possible to the expressions of the defilements that manifest, right? It's not, it's not somehow rejecting them or transcending them even. And she says, um, for women who are heavily socialized over millennia to be accommodating, nice, pretty, and enabling, anger is particularly shamed. An aspect of the wise, unchained feminine is transmuted anger into fierce truth-telling and protective compassion. Rather than shaping herself into a pretzel in service of distorted and immature power, which leaves her muted, manipulative, frustrated, damaged, and damaging, women can recognize the primordial root of luminous, fierce compassion through the liquid fire experienced in their bodies, demonized by the word angry, anger. This energy distilled into clarity and wisdom burns away the dross of our self-seeking desires and fears. And so how do you get to that, right? Isn't that what, <laughs> what we want? This is the red, hairy, angry, the red, hairy monster, hairy, red monster that feels like, ah, oh, sometimes feels like, God, this is always going to be here and I'm never going to win. <laughs> but it's this intimacy with the red, hairy monster that we start to feel into the power that's there and not be afraid, right? We have to connect, connect with even the force of anger as a teacher. Ah, and what is needed here? Like, how do I participate with this? How do I take care of this? This normal human experience, a normal response to injustice, a very normal response to injury. And so to understand anger as nature and nature as teacher, Right? listening deeply to even anger so that the ways in which we trust wisdom, the emergence of wisdom comes forward with patience and with time and with practice. And as we listen and trust, we can also take our, um, take the advice of the Buddha really, who was a radical experimenter. And before he, when he was the Bodhisattva on this path to awakening, you know, he did a lot of wild and crazy things, experimenting with not eating, for example, and leaving his family and all kinds of things. So we can trust that, you know, the Buddha and all of the wise teachers, Ajahn Chah and all of the teachers along the way, even the teacher of anger, right? we realize how to work with the truth of our experience by experimenting, by, by trying some things out. Even after the Buddha, um, on the night of his awakening, even after he realized the path of, or the fruit of his practice of non-clinging reached full enlightenment, you know, took a, a little bit of time. And then, you know, it is said that a, a person came by him and said something like, who are you? And he, his response was, was, I'm the Tathagata. Or, you know, one way of describing that is the one who is truly gone or thus gone or something like that. And the person was like, okay, dude, and just walked away. And so realizing that, you know, this, the teachings and the way that we participate with the teachings and the teachings of our own experience, the teachings of the external world, the Dhamma, you know, is really 
is really related directly to the context of our times. And the Buddha exemplified this again and again, said one thing to one person, another thing to another. And when he said, I am the Tathagata and heard the response, received the response from the person, then, you know, had to think about that. Well, okay, it's not the best way to communicate the truth. It may not, you know, somehow, it's not like it's a wrong statement or anything like that. But realizing that the, our participation with the teachings is really, should be directly related to the times in the context of our lives. So we each get to really figure out what this looks like. Noticing, yeah, just intuiting into the depth of our hearts, feeling into the body. We know where wisdom lives. Be willing to notice our special flavor, even if it surprises us. And here we might feel into really the depth of the teachings, but we have to get out of the way and just allow expression. I had talked about this a bit, but several years ago, went through some health challenges that persisted for quite a while. And over the course of this winter, what I remember now as I look back on that, Time is just this really deep seeking freedom. Like what is freedom in the context of a body that is uncontrollable and there aren't any answers and there's no certainty. You know, it's hypothetical until there's a health crisis in which many of us know what that's like. And then it's real. And we're kind of learning, learning this more and more every day as we, make our way through this pandemic. But what I remember most profoundly about that winter is these late night walks all bundled up in the freezing cold and just feeling the pounding of my feet on the earth in my neighborhood and really encouraging the discharge of energy. So this tight energy, this bound up energies, stagnant energy, anxious, angry, whatever it was, you know, I was somehow not even important to name it that direct, you know, that specifically, but what was, what this heart was very interested in was freedom that was found as energy kept moving and moving and moving. And somehow in that movement, right, that movement and the tears and the pounding of the earth and the breathing and expansion and of the body as it breathed and moved was this deepening into this experience of change. And so it's not like we're just kind of on some um, simple program of, yeah, but it's really a deep practice, this expression, right? That this creative expression that we offer as we learn how to participate skillfully, not be afraid of the, all of the various expressions of the heart. And we can feel just like I was um, articulating, might feel the power of change or the flow of nature in these habit energies of mind, anxiety or anger or whatever realizing this oh, as we get close to and feel the value of seclusion and allowing space for this energy to be whatever it is, then realizing, oh, this isn't me. It doesn't even feel like me. It's just kind of here. And if it were up to me, I'd make it go away. And there's no chance of doing that right now. So this can't be mine, really. And realizing this when we don't ignore it or somehow 
try to force ourselves to be a more calm human. Like that's a misunderstanding of the path. But this reality, this deep teaching is revealed to us. The deepest wisdom here is revealed to us through this activity of listening and participating and allowing the body to express it. Express it. Like, oh, how does the body want to move this? Perhaps it is in crying. And healing happens this way. Tears can be really nourishing, cathartic even. And maybe it's in dancing or moving in some, moving the body in some way, or maybe it's just talking to someone else and being witnessed, right? There's some expression, some acknowledgement, some participation in the listening that happened when we include each other and allow ourselves to be witnessed and do the witnessing for each other. And perhaps there are many other ways that you might think of or that might come forward from you from who knows where, right? From the depths of ancestor wisdom or when we listen. But there might be many ways that we move energy, discharge energy, and that this heart body system learns how to let go, learns how to not cling, learns how to feel into the flow of nature that is being illuminated for us in each moment. Chanting is another great way to let energy move. And so in part, this, these reflections today come from um, this feels like wisdom, deep wisdom there from somewhere that understands the problems that we face either individually or collectively aren't going to be solved with a finite number of strategies and maybe aren't going to be solved even with the strategies that we have. But when we really listen deeply with wise attention, with the an understanding of going to the root, going to the womb, Yani Somana Sikara, that there's a depth here that's discoverable. And when we know things like life isn't a thing, it's not a destination, and there isn't one tool. And we're always in relationship with experience and each other. And concepts are just things. They're just ways to make life more functional. But it's not the end of the road. Neither is this job or this body. Right? Then we find ourselves in a dynamic relationship with life itself and can learn to access some kind of creativity that will support us in our collective growth and movement. Right? And that will actually support this creativity then supports coming up with the solutions that we might need. Also, you know, remembering that the trial of Derek Chauvin is coming up just around the corner, jury selection, unless things are postponed, will happen in a few days. And so how are we going to support each other and stay connected to the truth as we participate skillfully in this unfolding. How are we gonna be, how are we gonna exemplify the path of a Buddhist practitioner here? And again, you know, not with some, I'm not asking for us to have the answers. I certainly don't have the answers but it definitely seems that creativity and expression and participation and relationship and understanding the depth of the teachings and not kind of letting, allowing the mind to take a shortcut, which is what the mind naturally does when it's faced with a dilemma that feels unresolvable, like takes a shortcut to happiness. I know I'll go for blame or I'll go for rejection or some kind of separation. But as practitioners, we know that that's not, it's not even real or true. So how do we 
notice that shortcut when the mind is taking that and go back to the source, go back to the root, to this radical reflection. What is wise attention right now, sweetie? What is the kind of honoring, the reverence, the love that will support the creativity and participation that will be onward leading for us, that will produce learning? Mm -hmm. 